everyone, and welcome to the Live Through Jesus podcast with Courtney Gilman. On this episode, we're going to be talking about worship and betrayal, the first two commandments given to the people by God. And I'll be reading all of these from the ESV version. They're found in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. Quickly before we get started, if you're new to Live Through Jesus, make sure you go to livethroughjesus.com and sign up to receive your free five-week Bible study over Abraham. There you'll also find blog posts that coincide with the teachings on this podcast and social media links, which is another way to keep in touch throughout the week. Okay, let's get started. How would you feel if your spouse was praising someone else above you? You just sit there and listen to them talk about how wonderful this other woman was and how great she is and all these things that she does that probably you don't. You had to sit and listen to that. How would you feel about that? How would you feel if they gave that person gifts? If they sacrificed their time or their money or, you know, something for this person? How would you feel if you knew that they had affection for this person? If they talked to this person more than they talked to you, if they spent more time with them, even if they hadn't been unfaithful to you sexually, you would still feel betrayed. Whether you would call that adultery or not, you would still feel betrayed. I would, for sure. And the reason for that is because there are things that our spouse is supposed to give to us that they're not supposed to give to anyone else. We have a right to things that no one else has from them. And so today we're gonna talk about our betrayal to God. If he ever feels betrayed by us, if he ever feels like the jilted spouse, the one that doesn't get the attention or the praise or the sacrifice or the gifts that other people get. And so that's the gist of the first and the second commandments. And those are the things that we're going to be talking about today. The Ten Commandments are found both in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. And so I'm not going to read in both places. I'm only going to choose one of the two places to read in. We're going to read in Deuteronomy today. So Deuteronomy 5, 7 through 10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or anything that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. So the first two commandments that God gave to the people were not to worship or serve any other gods. They couldn't even acknowledge that there were other gods, that these gods were gods, because they aren't, right? There are no other gods. God is the only God. No other nation's gods were alive. No other nation's gods could act on their behalf. No other nation's gods could see or hear They have no ability, so they cannot be gods. Let me read to you what it says in Psalm 115, 3 through 9. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they don't feel. Feet, but they don't walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So do you notice all of the things that other gods cannot do? Obviously, we already know this, but. Um, I want you to listen to this. This is a hilarious uh, situation that happens in 1 Kings 18, 26 to 29. This is when um, Elijah is trying to prove that God is the only true God against the Baal worshipers. 
And so it says, they took the bull that was given to them. This is the Baal worshipers. And they prepared it. And they called upon the name for, of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them and he said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself, or maybe he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep. Maybe you need to wake him up. <laughs> they cried out loud and they cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. At midday, as midday passed, they raved on until the time of offering of the obligation, but there was no voice. No one answered them. No one paid attention. <laughs> he's like, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he just can't hear you. Maybe he, maybe he, his ears aren't, aren't too good anymore. Maybe, maybe he's, he's gone somewhere, right? And so that's how stupid it is that these people are worshiping other gods, right? These are things that we don't understand. We don't see how this could even possibly be a thing. But we do do it in a certain sense. And so it's a good thing for us to still talk about because we do do it in a certain way. But anyway, then they did. They worshiped these other gods and they would be either things that God had made, like the sun and the moon and the stars, the creation of some sort, right? Or it would be something that man had made, a carved image. That's why he says, don't worship other gods is the first command. And then the second command is don't carve images for yourselves and worship those things. And so either way, there's something that God made or it's something that a man made. And so how is something that someone else made above the thing that made it? That doesn't make any sense, right? How can this God, if the people made it, how can it have any power above the people? And if God made it, then how can it have any power above God? These are not real things, right? And so it doesn't make a lot of sense, but for some reason they still are doing this. And so this must feel like a huge betrayal to the Lord. If you're praying to another God, it's like you don't have faith in him, right? He must not be able to provide this thing for you. So you're going to go and ask someone else. So it is a betrayal to him. It is a lack of faith on our part. And it's also, as we've just shown, a complete waste of time. Jeremiah 14, 22, Are there any among the false gods of the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? So if the gods can't do it, can, can the skies just do it on their own? Are you not he, O Lord our God? We set our hope on you because you are the one that does all these things. Habakkuk 2, 18 to 20. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing awake, to a silent stone arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, but there's no breath in it at all. But the Lord in his holy temple let all the earth keep silent before him. So just over and over, it's explaining how we are making these things. They can't be above us. They have no life in them. They have no ability. They can't do anything. And so God is jealous when we worship other things and act as if they have ability that he doesn't, when obviously that's not the case. And so he is jealous because he desires the things that are rightfully and uniquely his, namely worship, praise, sacrifice, right? And so having anything to do with another God is like cheating on the one and true only God. They're committing adultery by betraying him with another. And so that brings us to the, to the point that we were talking about earlier with our spouses. Would we like it if they were praising someone else? If they were making sacrifices for that other person? If they were bringing gifts to that person? If they were acting as if that person could do something for them that we aren't? How hurtful is that? 
And so God wants us to understand his relationship with us in the same way that we would understand our relationship with our spouses. That's how we can comprehend the things of God in some sort of way and in our human way, right? And if, if our spouse did something like that, there would be some sort of consequences. It would damage our relationship at the least. And so God says, there's going to be consequences for those that don't worship me alone. That's what he said in the, in the command. Let's look back at it. Uh, this is Deuteronomy 5, 9. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the fourth, the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. So he's saying the effects of that sin will affect many people. You will have consequences. Children do uh, uh, feel the effects of their parents' faith, do they not? I mean, obviously, we can believe in God if our parents did not, and we can not believe in him if they do. But the way they feel about God and the way that they serve him and the way they treat him does affect us. And then God says, on the other hand, verse 10, he shows steadfast love to thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. And so on the opposite side, if our parents are faithful and they love the Lord, that is handed down to us. We see it and we mimic that. Now, before these commandments are reiterated in Deuteronomy 4, Moses kind of explains a little bit why they're not supposed to worship a carved image. And so this is Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 31. And it says, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that's on the earth, the likeness of a winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground or any fish that is in the water under the earth. Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, that you are drawn away and you bow down to them and you serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the people under the whole heavens. But the Lord has taken you and he's brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me because of you. He swore that I shouldn't cross the Jordan and that I shouldn't enter the good land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan, but you shall go over and take possession of that good land. So take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and you make a carved image, or you form anything that the Lord has forbidden for you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, or by doing anything that is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but you will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the people, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord your God will drive you. There you will serve other gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat or smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God, and you will obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He won't leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant that he made with your fathers that he swore to them. And so what he's saying is, since when God delivered these Ten Commandments from this voice on the glory cloud, you didn't see him. You have no idea what he looks like, so don't try to make an image of him. Also, don't look up at the sky or the creation that he's made and worship it as if it has any significance over the one that created it. God is a spirit and he has to be worshiped in spirit. 
John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Romans 1, 22 to 25, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their heart, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And so Moses, when he's telling them, don't do these things, he says, remember, I'm not going to get to go with you into the land. And so I'm telling you now, this is very important. Do not do this. If you do, God will take you from this land that he's just given you. And he will send you out into other nations and let you get captured by those nations. And then you will serve the gods of those nations. And then you can see how good those gods are. Then you can see if they can do anything for you, right? What, what's the purpose of God letting them stay in the land that he has given them if they don't worship him? If they want to worship another God, they want to ask another God for something, go do that. See how it works for you, right? Don't get to, you don't get to stay in this land that I gave you. If you think that other gods can give you things, go there. Live under their rule. See what they can do. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. God does not share his love his praise, his worship with another, just as we don't want to do with our spouses, right? Okay, and then further in that Deuteronomy verse uh, 32 through 40 says, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials and signs and wonders and war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in, the, in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There's no other besides him. Out of heaven, he let you hear his voice that he might discipline you. On earth, he let you see his great fire and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today and lay it in your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may prolong the days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. And so Moses is reminding them how amazing God is, how much God loves them, how powerful he is, and, and showing them there's no need to serve other gods and that obeying and serving and living under this God is beneficial to them. He's already done all these great things. Have you ever heard of a God that does this, that listens to his people, that converses with them, that works on their behalf, that takes them out of mighty nations and brings them into a place where other nations already exist and dispossess those nations? He's already done that for you in Egypt, and he's about to do that for you in the promised land. Have you ever heard of a God that, that's that powerful, that acts on behalf of his people, that cares about his people like this, even if any of these gods ever had any ability to care for their people, could they act on their behalf? No. And so he says, have you ever heard of anybody that can do anything like this, this God that you serve? There isn't anybody like that. And so providing that he loves you this much and that he is able to do this much, don't you want to serve him? Don't you want to live under him? You know, he's trying to, to compel them to please 
Obey these laws whenever they get into the promised land because it is important for them. It will be a benefit to them. They will live long in this land if they obey the Lord. And if they don't, then they won't. And so just a couple more thoughts for you and I today. Do you know how powerful and special your God is? Moses is trying to convey that to the people. Have you had experiences with God that reveal his power to you? Has he acted on your behalf? Has he ever done anything that you know that it was him? It could not have been anyone else. No other God, as these people are praying to, could do these things. And no one else can do these things for us. Have you ever had God work on your behalf in a way like that, that you know that there's, it's, it's only him? He's the only one that could have done that. Has he ever helped you? overcome something that you know you couldn't have done on your own. If he hasn't, then ask other people to share their experiences with you so that you can see his power and understand how he works on behalf of his people. Also, ask him. Just go to him and say, God, I need to see you working on my behalf. I need you to reveal yourself to me. I want a relationship with you. I want to see your power. I want to see your love. I, I have been blinded up to this point. I'm sure you've been working for me, but I haven't seen it. And so do something that will help me to see how much you love me and how much you care about me and how you're able to work on my behalf. God wants to reveal himself to us. And if we are opening our eyes and we are searching for him, he says, if you will seek me, you will find me. So ask him to reveal himself and then, and then seek after him. Seek to see what kind of God you are being asked to serve. When you see that, when God acts on your behalf in a way that no one else could, when you've lost all hope, nothing else will work. You've gone to every person, every God like these people did, every person that you can think of and nobody can help you. You've done everything in your own power and nothing works. When all of those choices fail and you finally go to God, and he works on your behalf and you see that he's able to do something that no one else can do, you will love him. You will want to serve him. You will not want to betray him. You will not want to hurt him. You will want to show him the same kind of love that he's shown to you. And that's what Moses is trying to convey to the people right now. Remember the things that God has done for you. Remember how he's done things that no one else can do so that you will be compelled to obey him. You will be compelled to serve him and you will not want to betray him. We don't want to betray the people that we love. Knowing his power, seeing his love will motivate us to seek him even more. It will motivate us to talk to him even more. It will motivate us to listen to him better, to trust him more fully, um, to obey his commands. And that is the goal. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says, One has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So do you see what he's saying is that Jesus died for us. And providing that he died for us, we no longer want to live for ourselves. We want to live for him that died for us. If he's going to lay his down, life down for us, the least we can do is serve him. You know, anybody that does something like that for us, we owe them, right? We feel like we owe them. And then listen to this verse about God's love for us and our love for him in return. 1 John 4, 7, all the way through 19. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God showed, revealed his love for us by sending his son to die for us. That is love. That gives us ability to live eternally through his son, Jesus. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. Beloved, 
if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he abides in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And so we don't want to betray a God that loves us that much. If you have a lover that sacrifices everything for you, that gives everything for you, that is everything to you that you could possibly need, you don't want to betray that person. But like the Israelites, I fear that we sometimes do, right? We we definitely have. And so these are just some things that we can think about. Have you ever praised another for something that God did? Do you ever sacrifice for others, but you're not willing to sacrifice for God? You'll do this for your kids, for your husband, for your friends, but you won't get up on Sunday morning. You won't get up early and read your Bible. You won't stay up late and read your Bible. You won't read instead of watch TV or go to Bible study instead of rest. You're all about service. You do things for everybody else. Do you do things for God? Have you ever looked to someone else for help when just like those other gods, they can't help you? They have no power, no more power than you do. Definitely not the power of God. He's really the only one that's able. Do we go to him or do we go to other people? Have you ever placed your faith in someone or something over him? Do you talk to, spend time with, your friends, your family, over God. It's not that we're not supposed to spend time with those people, but do we choose to spend time with them when we should be spending time with God? Do you tell them what's happening in your life before you tell him? You wouldn't like that if your husband called some other woman on his way home and told them about their day, right? When we do this, most likely God's saying the same thing that he was saying to these people Remember, I told you, we don't serve other gods. We don't have these carved images. But God's saying the same thing to us. What can these things really profit you? Are they above their creator? Same question for us today. We all have done it. We'll do it again. Thankfully, he has grace for us. He died for us. And so our sins are forgiven. And we're thankful for that because we're never going to be perfect. But we don't want to hurt him. We don't want to betray our God. And so those two first two commandments may seem like they don't pertain to us anymore, but they do. So as we get started with the Ten Commandments, keep that in mind that he deserves our praise. He deserves our sacrifice. He deserves our time. He should be top priority. Everything else should fall below him. That's how we start out this entire study of the laws, okay? So next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about these two laws before we move on to the third one. So make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss that episode. Also, if you haven't already, go to my website, livethroughjesus.com. Look around at the blog posts. Hopefully, there'll be a, a post that pertains to this. And then also you can get your free Bible study there if you just put in your email address. I'll send that right to your inbox for you to download. And then join me on all social media. I try to post uh, several verses at least throughout the week and a couple of thoughts. So join me all those places and then I'll see you back next week.
Thanks. Have a good day.